right. So everybody, welcome. Thank you for joining us on August the 10th. Um, today we're going to have um, Elizabeth um, speaking to us about kind of what it is to go from, to go into tech, to join us and to, and to be able to, um, to see how it's going. Um, sorry, that's a bad introduction. <laughs> no, I feel like I let her, I let her kind of give herself more of an introduction, how she started and how she's gone from, you know, zero to a hundred to that first position. Uh, the only announcements that we, that I do have for this one is, um, remember that Refactor Tech is going to be online and it's coming up in next week. So if you still haven't, it's a great conference. It's uh, inclusion diversity. It's going to be online. It's uh, it's not an expensive conference. It's definitely worth it. And there will be they definitely cover some React, a little bit about everything. But it's a great conference. They'll have some workshops. They even have a career fair, so virtual career fair. So anybody looking for an opportunity or positions, that's definitely one of the great things is to go. And they make a great point of working with inclusive companies, and and that. So. Uh, that's it for me. I am going off to now to pass it off to Elizabeth and let her take it away. All right. Hey, everyone. Um, sorry I was a few minutes late. That is, I guess, something that happens once you start um, working again. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, so my name is Elizabeth, um, like Martin said. I am a junior developer at a place called Axio Indicator. Um, we're in the cybersecurity space. Uh, prior to this, I spent, you know, my career in service and in retail. Um, so yeah, I'll kind of talk about what it's like to kind of completely switch gears um, nearly 15 years into um, into a career. But yeah, um, so like I said, I, I had been uh, working in retail. I had for a very short period of time uh, my own clothing line. Um, and I, <laughs> in late 2019, um, it became very clear to me that I was going to need to do something else. Uh, I didn't, I didn't want to make a change uh, at nearly 30. But <laughs> you know, I, it, I really needed to, um, if I was going to be fulfilled and, you know, happy. So I kind of sat down and I and I wrote down the things that I liked to do in my hobbies um, and at my job. And then I wrote down the things that I didn't like about my job. And I thought about what kind of careers would give me what I wanted and what I needed, um, where I could do the things that I enjoyed. And then, you know, at least for the most part, kind of skip out on those things that I didn't. Um, with the caveat that like nothing is ever perfect and there is go always going to be something about a job that you don't particularly like. Um, but that being said, I, I kind of came to the conclusion that, you know, a, a career in tech was probably the best fit for me. So, um, you know, at first, um, when I was thinking about that pivot, I, I was interested in UX UI. Um, I did a lot of research leading up uh, to to the decision I made. Um, and it it was just very obvious that there are not as many careers in UX UI, um, which I guess kind of makes sense because I think, you know, anecdotally, probably for all of us, for every 100 coders we know, we know one person with a UX UI job. So um, there just aren't as many careers out there right now for that for that field. But um, you know, I, I gave coding more of a chance. And so I did some of that on my own um, to see if I would like it. And then I decided that I would, and I decided to start thinking about the best way to get into that. And so, um, you know, I, like I said, this was the end of 2019 and I made a plan to work through 2020 into early 2021. And at that point, either you know, go back to school or go to a coding boot camp. Make the decision at the time about what would be best 
And so I started doing a lot of research into that, kind of came to the conclusion that a boot camp was probably going to be the best fit for me um, for a lot of different reasons. And, and maybe I don't totally know like the format of just like a talk like this. So kind of shoot from the hip. And if somebody wants to interrupt and ask questions about, you know, part of it, feel free to do that. But, um, but yeah, I, you know, I, I did a lot of research. I came to the conclusion that I wanted to do boot camp and not go back to, you know, a university or a trade school. And, um, and so I started, I started working towards that, right? And this is still the end of 2019 at this point. And um, we get into 2020 a few months in and all of my plans are derailed because we go into a worldwide pandemic. <laughs> so, you know, at, um, in March, I get furloughed from my job and we close the entire store for a few months. And when I'm called back in, um, it still seems too early. Um, I'm, I'm sure you guys all still remember, or unless you just blacked out for it, that um, May of, of 2020, we still didn't really have a lot of information about, um, you know, long-term effects, obviously, because nobody had really had it for that long. Um, we didn't know, I, I think at that point, we were still kind of unsure of how exactly asymptomatic um, transmission worked and so there was just a lot of unknowns i really didn't want to go back to working with the public at that point and so uh, i put in my notice and i decided to start looking for a boot camp right away and i um i did you know i, I talked to a lot of people i looked at a lot of different statistics i read uh, an ungodly amount of course report reviews and i decided on Flatiron. Um, their software engineering boot camp, and so uh, I applied for the Atlanta location. And the day after I applied, they said that they were closing the Atlanta location due to COVID. Um, so I applied again for the online program, and and that started um, in July. And so I went back to work uh, for about a month. Um, but uh, after that. I, you know, a few days after quitting, I started at Flatirons um, Software Engineering Bootcamp. So, yeah, I um, I finished that in December. Uh, I got my first job um, at the very end of March. Um, and that process of of doing the bootcamp, um, it was so difficult. <laughs> it was. It was a lot of fun. Um, I really, I, I loved the people that I got to meet there. Um, I had a really incredible and supportive cohort, um, but it is a lot because they are trying to get you job ready in less than six months. And so there, there's so much to know in coding. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, we got to December and I did not feel quite job ready. And because of the way that Flatiron's agreements were set up at the time, and I think they've changed them because of COVID, um, but because of the way they were set up when I decided to go there, uh, you had two months, I think, six weeks or two months to declare your job search start date. And so I took that entire time just boning up on, on coding stuff. I did like, you know, morning till night, like Udemy courses and personal projects to try to get at a place where I felt like I was, I was interview ready. And then um, when I declared that job search start date, I uh, was in a lot of Slack channels. Um, I, I think I was in like Tech 404 and Women Who Code and one called Breaking Into Tech. Um, and I just used those to find people who are looking for jobs. Um, all of them have job boards. And so I was constantly applying, reaching out to people and asking if they wanted to talk to me. Um, and one of those people was like, yeah, I would I would love to chat. And so uh, we had a little Zoom call. I talked to her, I got to know her, know some about the company that she worked for. Um, she sent my name to her boss. Her boss emailed me um, that week and that, is how I started to get my current job. <laughs> uh, it was obviously not the only place I, I applied to, but um, 
I guess the most relevant one. <laughs> so, so getting that job, um, I went through four rounds of interviews and, or, or three rounds of interviews and a test for them. Um, so the first interview was with uh, the CTO, um, my boss, and that was just like a, a chat, like we just met each other. And then the next round was a panel with a few of the developers on the team. Um, and that was, uh, it was, it was invaluable because I got to actually know some of the people on the team. I think it was like an hour long interview. Um, and so I really felt like I, I got a chance to kind of peek behind the curtain and see what it would be like to work with them. Um, and for me, I guess at least like, I, I tend to think like, you know, if somebody's really nice in an interview, like they're going to be really nice to work with. Um, because I think that generally, probably they kind of want to scare you away in an interview, um, just to filter out people. So I don't know, might not have the same view as me on that, but that is, that was kind of the, the way I saw it. And, um, and I think that I was right. You know, they're, they're an incredible team to work with. Um, so that was my panel interview, um, after which I had to take like a cognitive assessment sort of test. Um, and I was terrified for that. <laughs> and I studied a lot, I guess, for as much as anyone can study for a cognitive assessment. There was an app that I used called Job Flare, which would um, sort of test you um, in different activities that are, are similar to what would be on a cognitive assessment. And I, I took, you know, any free one I could find online just to see how I would do. Um, so I did that. And then um, my last interview was a collaborative coding interview um, where we just picked, you know, one of the tasks that they had on their, on, on their, you know, work board on Azure. And we just did it together um, with one of their senior engineers. And um, he also was just really, really kind and um, really collaborative. And um, so after that, I, I was offered a job um, and I stayed in the job search for um, pretty much the entirety until I signed my offer letter with them um, because I had heard like horror stories of people, people having their job offers rescinded. Um, and so I was, I was terrified and I just, I just kept interviewing and reaching out and stuff until I was signed and I had my computer in my hand. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that was, that was getting a job. And then since then it's been about four months and, um, I would liken it to like, you know, I may have learned to build like a birdhouse in, in the coding boot camp, and now I'm being handed some tools and told to build like an entire actual house. <laughs> so like there's, it, it is so different um, because like, you know, I think intellectually I knew it, but it, it just didn't really sink in like how huge these apps are that you're going to work in, right? When you enter a company, and even, you know, even for us, like we're a pretty young startup, I think um, Actio is only seven years old and, and the app is just, I mean, it's huge, right? Like it has, it's had a team of developers on it for seven years. So like you could just imagine, you know, how much you, you can do on a personal project and just multiply that by enough for an entire team to work on it every day for seven years. Like, <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it, it, it is the sheer magnitude of it. It, it can be quite intimidating, but, um, but yeah, I am, I am learning so much. Um, my job is, I guess, technically full stack um, and that we don't have different engineers for the front end, back end um, or DevOps. So I have done a little bit of everything. And um, yeah, I just, I'm, I'm learning so much. It's been truly incredible um, and not sort of a broad overview, but I would love to answer questions, which I think maybe. Uh, sure, I think if you, yeah, if you have any questions, uh, type them up, anything that you're in there. Uh, if it's okay, I think you just kind of have some that maybe can guide you into answering some things. So for the job search, were there any 
any particular uh, sites or places that you use for looking at what jobs were out there or anything like that helped you? Yeah, I used LinkedIn mostly. Um, I know Indeed is a really popular one, um, but I did not find Indeed that helpful for my personal job search, but, but LinkedIn was great because you could you could apply and then immediately reach out to the hiring manager kind of in one place. So that was really, that was really great. Um, okay. I think I asked what my portfolio looks like. Um, yeah. It um, it's pr it's pretty simple. I can send it in the chat. Uh, let me let me just get that. Um, I can say now it hasn't even it hasn't even been that long, and I'm already like, you know, a little embarrassed about it. <laughs> um, just like I think you know, um, any anyone would you know probably look at work they've done. Uh, did your portfolio or anything come up in the interviews or when you were searching for it? Did anybody reference it? That kind of thing. Just um, like while you were going through the through the job interviews, did they bring up the portfolio? Did they reference to it? Ask you questions about it? Yeah, um, they asked me questions about um, you know what, like how I had hosted it and um, you know what I was using, like for the back end, um, which my portfolio does not have a back end. I'm using Contentful to get the blog on there. And then everything else is just hard coded in so um, so that I could use Netlify. Um, so they asked questions about it, but it, well, there wasn't a huge focus on my portfolio. Um, and that, to be frank, uh, and I, I'd be interested to hear what it was like for other people, but I, um, had heard from most of my cohort mates that the portfolio was either very minimally referenced or was never referenced in their interview. So, so for me personally, I kind of made it a bit of a back burner project. Um, I think that it's really important to have a, a good portfolio if you're going for a front end specific job. Um, but especially, you know, your first junior job, I, I found that most people said that it wasn't as necessary for them to have one. Um, so yeah, that's that. That was why I made the decision I made there <laughs> to, okay. to sort of make it quickly and <laughs> just. Well, no, I think it definitely worked out for you. Um, uh, now, once you started in there, like, what what were the kind of the going into like a tech company first few days or something? How was that for you? What was Difference and we'll ask some questions. The questions uh, next, but yeah, um, yeah. How was that for you? How was the first few days? Um, the first few days were overwhelming for sure um, because you're trying to set up a local environment that, again, is just for for a huge, you know, a huge application. Um, so so it can be a little overwhelming, um, but you know, for, for me and on our team, they really made it as seamless as they could. Um, so I paired with people for the first few cards that I worked on. Um, I didn't work really on anything on my own um, until um, like a week and a half or two weeks in. Um, and even still, I pair a lot, like all the time. Like we are constantly pairing on stuff. <laughs> but, um, especially in those, in those first few like early days um, there were a lot of people you know reaching out to make sure that everything was going well um, and that I was I was feeling supported um, so yeah I mean it you know I, I think probably the early days are a lot of housekeeping right like you know do you feel good is your local environment set up do you know how to use everything how are you feeling like navigating the code base you know Okay. Anything you would tell yourself right now, even just a few months in, that might have helped in those first couple of days? Yeah. Um, well, hmm. anything new? I would tell myself, like, it doesn't seem like it, but you absolutely will get to know the code base, and it won't take as long as you think it is. Like, it, it seems overwhelming, but you will get used to it. And, and navigating around it. And I think that that would have helped. Maybe it, it probably wouldn't have changed 
anything practically for me, but it probably would have made me feel a lot better to know that like you will, you do get used to it. Um, okay. Uh, did we, yeah, we have some questions. Uh, what courses did you focus on? And I think this is the kind of post school, like when you said you did so Udemy course and things like that, what kind of courses did you focus on? Yeah, I focused um, a lot on, I did um, these Jonas Schmetman courses, I think. Um, he has a JavaScript one that is, is really great and really thorough um, for JavaScript. Um, I also did his um, HTML and CSS, CSS SAS and Node.js course. And I found those to be really invaluable because they're so thorough. Um, I also did, um, so when I was interviewing for this job, they told me um, that probably some of the, the coding interview would have GraphQL involved. And I wasn't too familiar with GraphQL. I had um, kind of encountered it and used it like a tiny bit, but not enough to feel comfortable. And so I did um, like a pretty quick, like four hour, like Net Ninja course on GraphQL. Um, and I thought that that one was really good too. Um, and that one, that one actually was probably like a bit more fun because it's a little bit older. So um, especially for me at that point, like not feeling so confident, it was a good way to kind of boost my confidence with support, like, you know, solving problems. Um, the course used class components for its React stuff. And, um, and I knew that at my current job, they were kind of moving away from all of their class components. And so um, I was, you know, switching those over to functional components with hooks. So I think it was nice to, to not have the total support that you would have in a boot camp, but actually like still some support, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. And I did like a Gatsby course too. And then a lot of it was just like my own projects so that I could, yeah. Yeah, familiar with it, that makes sense. Uh, another one is, uh, how did you learn algorithms and data structures? I mean, that seems a little specific, but. Yeah, I did not. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't, that was another thing. So, so I would tell you now the same thing I guess I told myself at the time, like you, cannot focus on everything all at once like it is just, it's too much like you will constantly be learning you will constantly be learning a lot more than maybe like any other hobby or like industry right like there's just so much to know and there's so much changing in tech all the time that like you have to kind of at a point just sit down and say like what is worth focusing on right now and to me, like it was, it was a lot of anecdotes, but I was like, I'm gonna listen to the people who are interviewing right now, you know, that are coming out of my boot camp interviewing for the same kind of jobs that I would be interviewing for. And what are they telling me? Like, are they, are they telling me that like, you know, they are getting hit with a lot of data structures and algorithms, then I'll focus on that. But if, if pretty much everybody is telling me like they're never really encountering these problems, then, you know, unless somebody tells me my interview is going to be data structure and algorithm focused, I'm probably not going to do it. And to be honest, none of my interviews, I mean, had them at all, you know, like, I think at like FANG jobs, for sure, you're going to run into those. But for a lot of, especially like smaller companies, it seems like they're mostly not doing that anymore. Um, there were a lot of collaborative interviews. Um, there was an interview where I was asked to refactor something, um, and it wasn't even it wasn't even coding. It was just refactoring was my interview. So, um, so I, I felt good about not studying those at the time. They're still worthwhile to study, but it wasn't something that I gave a lot of time to um, because I didn't want to. I didn't want a job at one of the the bigger tech companies, especially not coming right out of a boot camp. Um, yeah. Well, no, and I think that makes sense. Kind of just a little point is that it depends on what company you're going for. Like if, if it's a fintech company where they're working with algorithms or anything with analytics, then those are going to be more important. But if you know that's not going to be your job title, then they may not be unimportant. It might not be something you really encounter. 
Um, one of the other questions is, says, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure about how to negotiate salary or even how much I can expect. I mean, it's a big question, any, but any tips or anything that you ran into while you were doing that first initial job? Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of different stuff that people say online, or even if you ask them, like, I think with all of this, right, you have to take it with a grain of salt because like what worked for me in my very specific situation is maybe not going to work for somebody else, but you can, you still take it and maybe apply it however you see fit to your own job search. So this is one of those, right? Like this is definitely one of those where everybody has an opinion. Everybody thinks they have the right answer. And I don't know what the right or wrong answer is because maybe I did the wrong thing, right? But like it worked for me. So, um, but I, I Googled a range for this area for junior developers. Um, I gave them the range that I found. I actually gave them a little higher than the range that I had found. Um, and I just sent that to them um, against everyone's recommendation, which was not to send them a range until I was offered something. Um, but they asked me point blank and I felt like I had to. So, um, so I gave them the range I was looking for. And um, when they gave me the offer, it was a little below that range. So, um, you know, basically what I did was just say like, hey, you know, I, I would really love to work with you guys. Um, you seem like a really great team and I'm really excited about what you're doing. I am looking to stay within the range I asked for. Is there any way that you could go up to, you know, even the smallest number in it? And they were like, yeah, we can meet you there, but we, we can't go above that. And, um, and yeah, I mean, I took it, um, like I said, it was, a, it was a little lower than I was, you know, I was hoping for the higher end of that range, but, um, you know, I was willing to take that small cut if it meant that I was going to be working on a team with, with really kind and patient and understanding people. Cause I was like, I'm, I'm so green. I'm going to need a lot of hand holding. So um, it's important to me that I'm working with people who, you know, are under, understanding of that and, and really supportive of somebody um, in the early days of their career. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, no, and I think that's, yeah, that is also very important. And I will kind of say, I don't add on to a little bit of what you said is that you want to have your range that you are comfortable with, right? And pers like personally, I've always shared the range. And I know that like my lower is just what I can't literally go below any, any point. So they know it and you, I'm giving them a range of what I know, what I know I'll be comfortable with. And it makes it straightforward. I know it's against what a lot of people say when you're trying to do the negotiations. But to me, it's always worked out. Um, I would like to open it up a little bit to, I mean, I know I've, I remember in the introduction, I heard some other senior developers or developers that have been working around. If you guys want to, you know, pitch in or say, you know, suggestions about this part of it, maybe we can hear some other point of views. If anybody wants to share. Anybody? No? It, I mean, it's open. Sure. It's a I'm not sure. Okay. Um, I'm a, my name is George. I've um, been developing React for about seven years. I'm new to Atlanta. I've worked for quite a few startups, Fortune 500s, Fortune 100s. And I learned that one thing is always be happy to talk about money. I think it makes everyone afraid. Like, no one wants to talk about, no one wants to feel like they left too much money on the table. <clears throat> but there's also the fear that you might get overpaid for a job position. I do err on trying to avoid talking about money because um, it does at some point, it sounds super critical. I don't want to tell them my salary, my, my number, because it puts you inside a range, right? So like, so I want to know how much do they value this position? And so if I give them a range and it's below what they expect, do they devalue me in that, in that role, right? And so like if you are, once you start to work your way up, so as a, as a junior level developer, I would say it, it doesn't matter as much. You need the experience. But once you get the experience, then you want to know how much they value you and how much do they value that position. So if you're a senior level position, are they, quanti are they, are they itemizing you in, in such a way that you don't have the value that you want to have? And therefore, I like to lean on, like, what are you trying to offer? 
Are you at the market value? Have you done your research? Because a lot of these companies have done research to say, what well, should I be paying these different positions at these different rates? And so they know what they will, they know what to expect from you. I almost feel like it's a trap for them not to tell you. No, thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Like I guess it's it's different from everybody. It's what you're comfortable with and how you look at it. Um, anybody else wants to share their point of view on this? That I've yeah, just just uh, just an advice like for junior developers, right? Yeah, and what uh, what your root uh, also said. You have to be careful. Be don't fall like in a way that you are being used, right? Like one thing is like getting the experience that you need. That's that's awesome. Like even getting the cut, like the first job you get, that's that's for me, it's acceptable, right? It's something that it's, it's more valuable, the experience you get. But once you get that experience, you, you, you have to make sure that they really value it. because if not like job hopping is, is a, an opportunity to to learn more again right and you need to keep doing that unless unless you really love the company where you are but you you need to keep learning and moving it's something that it, it gets you learning faster uh so yeah don't don't be afraid to shoot the moon there there is only two possibilities like they think you are crazy to ask for too much right but there, there is also the other side of the coin. Like, okay, she's asking too much. She, she really knows, or she really must know he, her value, right? So, uh, or else you are just dumb, like to ask too much. So, uh, yeah. Um, no, those are those are also really great. Uh, and also, just something else that I've, you know, I, I changed jobs in March, and one of the things is that remember, salary is not the only thing you can negotiate on. Uh, you can negotiate for more vacation time, for more of those things, and those, I mean, those end up becoming just as valuable, right? If you get some more days of vacation, some more time off, that's kind of things. Though that could almost be extra time or extra extra money. So, um, I think we had one other question of uh, for Elizabeth. Did you did you work within recruiters on your job search, or did you do your own thing? Um, I talked to Brett, who um, generally I think is in these meetups. I'm not sure that he's here today. Um, he um, recommended that I get a job and be in the industry for a year or two before I work with recruiters um, because generally they might not have really a lot of jobs or a lot of opportunities for people very early on in their career. Um, so that was the only recruiter I talked to during my during my job search. So yeah, I, I pretty much did my own thing. Um, that said, I'm totally not opposed to it and recruiters seem like a, a great deal. I have worked with them before for other jobs and and it was really nice to have them send jobs my way. So um, not opposed to it, but for this particular job search, I, I did not. Okay, that's great. Um, yeah, anybody else have any other kind of questions or anything else? And thank you so much. Yeah, this has been awesome. Um, Let's see yeah. if anybody has any other questions or no. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, anything that you want to kind of share any, you know, anything else, any extra kind of thoughts that you, that you have? Yeah. Um, um, I'd maybe say the same thing that I always tell myself for anything new that I'm starting um, and I'm sure most or all of you guys already know it but like when you're starting something new i think that you should expect maybe it maybe it would sound pessimistic but i think that you should expect to be somewhat bad at it um at the start and just give yourself a lot of grace um i think other people are going to give it to you as well you know um but just try your best to to be understanding um, of yourself with where you're at because 
because everyone's kind of bad when they start, right? Um, and if you and if you let yourself get too far down, right? Then like it can be really hard to keep progressing and to keep getting better. So um, if you just understand, you know, where you're going to start, right? Especially where you're going to start in your first job. And you know that that's where you're going to be and you give yourself grace in that, in that place, then it's easier to keep growing, right? To keep getting better. Um, okay. Yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, I don't know, definitely. Uh, <laughs> we have a couple, we have some more questions. Thank you, John. Uh, what was your collaborative interview like? Um, for, for the position I actually have, um, because I, I had a few of uh, the collaborative interviews, but for this position, um, it was, so So we went through their, I think it's like a Kanban board. Um, and we went through and we found a card that needed to be worked on, um, which I know people have like varying opinions on, on this as an interview practice, right? Like doing an actual piece of work the interview practice it didn't bother me personally so so i took the job but um yeah we went through the board um we found something that was not super easy to work on but relatively easy for somebody who doesn't know the code base and um then we implemented what it was asking so it was a it was a refactor or something they had done uh, they had built a table and it was in just like jsx and they wanted to use React tables, the library for it. And so it was refactoring and adding in React tables. Um, so yeah, they, they used that in another spot in the app. So it was, it was kind of like, find where else we're using this, implement it in this other place in a similar way. Um, so yeah, that was, that was Okay, uh, yeah. I guess that kind of pair, uh, pairs in with the next question. Uh, also, did you have any project interviews? Please make this thing with these specs. Uh, I seem to find a bunch of these types of interviews. Yeah, I heard about um, some people in my cohort had, had those. I did not have one at all. Most of my interviews were generally like, you know, refactored this thing that's in our actual code base or you know, refactor this thing that we have for interviews specifically. That was another one. So I, I never had like a take home project, but I heard a lot of people say that they had those. Okay. All right. Um, kind of, I guess, sorry, along with that, as you were looking for jobs, were there any particular like types of companies you were looking at? You weren't, you were kind of, there was, were there some that you were kind of avoiding? Yeah, um, I mostly cast a wide net because I, I knew like I was pretty new, not just to the tech industry as a career, but also like generally pretty new to like coding as a whole thing. So uh, I didn't want to get too specific. Um, I think it makes sense to be really specific if, you know, you've always wanted to do this, if it was like your dream since you were a child and you know where you wanted to work. But I didn't, I didn't really know like what kind of company I would want to work for. So I was, I thought it was suitable to cast a wide net um, and then, you know, work some places and then kind of narrow down like what sorts of places I want to work at later. Um, so I didn't really have anywhere in mind that I wanted to work specifically. Um, I just had the kind of team I wanted to work with. Uh, like I said earlier, just I, it was important to me that I worked with very nice people <laughs> that I liked my coworkers a lot. So I was like, I, you know, this is what's important to me, not necessarily the kind of work that we're doing, but, um, there were some places that I was very specifically staying away from. So I, you know, Amazon, they constantly have listings out there. I would not, I would not now, they could offer me like $500,000 and I would not work for Amazon. Like, I, so 
they were pretty much it where I was like, I no thank you. And no offense to anybody who wants to work for them or who does work for them. But for me, I was like, no, <laughs> no, I'm going to stay away from them and probably from other like fang companies for now. Um, there's a lot of pressure, I think, in those um, to perform at a level that I did not feel confident needing this early in my career. <laughs> so. No, that's fair. No, that's good. Um, I think we also had another question. So did you send any kind of cover letters for any of the... Yeah, okay. I, I send cover letters with everything. Okay. Uh, they were they tailor them. or generic? Were they generic cover letters? Did you tell oh, yeah, they were super generic. Yeah. I only sent one really creative cover letter, and um, I pretty quickly got a rejection for that job. So <laughs> um, I, I got to pretty generic at that point. <laughs> I don't think I get rejected because of my cover letter. I think I, I think they were just looking, they just weren't looking for anybody super junior. Um, it was, um, it was at Asana that I had sent that one. If you guys know that company, yeah. um, they're based in San Francisco. I had a, I have a friend who works there. So I was like, oh, just give it a shot. I don't think they're looking for anybody at my, at my level, but you know, why not? <laughs> I sent them a super creative cover letter. And it, it was a very swift no. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, I, we have a question that it's a little bit more broader for if anybody it applies to than want to answer it. Is, um, uh, somebody has worked in big tech company. If that's the case, is it true that work in those companies is better? I would say, I don't know if there's such a thing as better. Um, it is towards what your preference is. Like a large company like Salesforce, Amazon, uh, Microsoft, they give these packages. Uh, so you think about total compensation packages, like how much do you get bonuses? How much do you get uh, time off, vacations, and things like that? Uh, they give really, really attractive, like even healthcare. So the older you get, the more you care about healthcare. Their, their package system is really amazing. But sometimes, I mean, uh, you work in a very generic environment. So like uh, you might do the same task um, a thousand times without variation. Um, but at the same time, with a smaller company, uh, you may not get, you may have to work weekends. Uh, with startups, you may work long hours. Um, sometimes the, the vacation isn't the way you want it to be because like, they're hoping to get bigger themselves. But you still feel like you're part of uh, something that's um, more organic, uh, something that can grow. So I think that it's, it's a preference for um, sometimes your, your tolerance for pain or your tolerance for um, what you want to do. If you want to work free time, always have your weekends. The companies really kind of make sense. Um, but you, if you are adventurous and you are gluttonous for learning new things and staying on the, um, the leading cutting edge, then a small company is the way to go because they're, they're constantly adapting and needing to adapt to their markets. Yeah, I definitely second that. I've I've worked in different types of uh, of companies. Um, I just finished a startup. At a startup, you get to you get a better a, a faster chance of taking ownership of uh, of more parts of the code and kind of being the person responsible for it. But at the same time, that comes at um, there's less people. You taking a vacation could leave a lot of people stuck so you don't feel like you can really take those vacations whereas in a bigger company you take that time for yourself and it can be at different points in your life where you can be you know you can work at that uh, something like auto trader where you're part of a you know you're one of 50 or 100 developers things are may move at a slower pace may not you know they won't move as fast as you want it may take them a year to make a side mobile when they know they have to uh but but yeah, it works with your life schedule thing. So same thing, like right now I'm working at agency because I wanted something where I would be working in different projects every three to four months, right? Entirely different tech stacks because that's something that I want to do now. I've done the corporate, I've done the things, but I mean, I'm sure George can kind of reply to that. Like there's that's kind of the difference between a startup to to tech companies, also to corporate because there's a lot of different opportunities. Um, I think uh, we have one more question from Hugo um, for Elizabeth. If you 
if you could share what has been your kind of so far your biggest achievement in hardest sale was that meant for elizabeth uh, here you go i think if you want to okay yes it was for you so so far is there something that has been really worked that awesome or something that yeah um so i i mean biggest achievement uh we had a feature that a lot of customers were asking for um and i didn't know it prior to picking up that task that it was like a you know a glory task um that a lot of people wanted it but um yeah one of my one of my colleagues was like hey would you like to pair on this with me and so we worked on it together um and implemented this pretty pretty large feature um and then i i went and took on um, there was like a follow-up to that and finishing the feature and so i took that on as well and it ended up growing in scope by a lot um, and so i felt really good about you know where we ended on that um the customers and and um you know our cto and our uh, CPO were, were happy with the way that it was implemented and uh, and I got to take you know at least, at least some ownership of it um, along with the other people who helped me um, help me build that because it was, it was really big so yeah that was um, that would probably be the, the biggest achievement and then the hardest fail I did <laughs> I did a DevOps project uh, pretty recently because they wanted a demo um, instance of our application and uh, I took it on um, to pair with the same person who I had, I had, you know, built out that other feature with. Um, and then they ended up not being free and just through a series of events, somebody else came in to pair on it with me and then ended up kind of taking over um, in, a, in a way that I felt really pretty odd about because I was like, I'm not really learning anything. I'm just kind of taking back seat to this, like, um, you know, you would say like maybe like I was navigator in that pairing situation, but because I didn't know that much, I wasn't really able to navigate. So I just I felt like I you know was mostly just twiddling my thumbs, but my name was on this. So um, so yeah, uh, and I ended up pairing with our um, our chief product officer on it later in the week when the when the other person I had been pairing with was out of town, and. Um, it, it became very obvious to him that like I didn't know what I was what I was doing and he was like why is your name on this like why were you on this and I and so you know you, you, I, I had to kind of toe the line because obviously like I didn't want to throw you know this other person I had paired with under the bus but you know I I basically had to without throwing him under the bus and without trying to make myself sound really stupid say like you know I uh I, I basically didn't really work on this and I wasn't sure what the what the rules were in, in regards to like switching over the name on on a card um, because it seems like you know you guys don't really want that and uh, and so <laughs> I mean like he was really understanding he was just like a, a super nice guy but um, I mean it, it felt like a huge fail to me because I basically spent a, a week working on something that I you know even now don't really feel like I learned a lot on um, and you should probably never take a week doing something you're not learning on like you should find a way to learn in that week but yeah that, that felt like a pretty big failure to me I don't know that probably yeah. makes me sound really bad right now but you know. no and that's out of the you know that's that's part of the job I think this is you know it's in there and I appreciate the, you know, appreciate the question and you answering it because it's not always roses, you know, there's good and the bad with every, you know, with every experience. But um, I think we have another question. Um, when you were applying for jobs, how far did your, of your, how far out of your stack were you willing to apply for? Did you apply for only jobs that were technologies you're familiar with? Um, I mostly kept it to technologies I was familiar with. Like if, if a job was looking for like a Java developer or like Flutter developer, I kind of stayed away from it. Um, I think maybe there will come a time where I'm like, you know, where I feel really confident that like I have the coding logic just like down pat. And so like I could maybe switch from, you know, language to language, but I, at the point where I was looking for jobs coming out of the boot camp, I was like, I'd really like to keep it to things I feel you know, somewhat comfortable with. 
um, things I'd be comfortable being interviewed in, you know, without having to, to try to bone up on it first, just in case somebody interviews me and they don't let me use like Google or something, right? Like, so I, I didn't really go too far out, but um, obviously I like, you know, like I said, like we use GraphQL, um, mm -hmm. which is not something that prior to this job I was really familiar with. So I didn't keep it like neat and tight within the stack I knew, but you know, um, I, I was pretty comfortable with React and they were using that. So. Oh, fair enough. Um, uh, John, you had a question about the average lines of code produced. I don't, and maybe you can also put your suggestion on this. I don't think that's a stat that anyone will really, that really you know, follows or even looks at. I don't know how you would get it. Uh, to me, it's more, to me, what I've normally, what you get, the stat that they kind of follow is your velocity, right? How many points are you working on and that? Nobody's looking at how many lines of code you are doing. Is that something that you'd see now or? Yeah, I mean, I've never even heard anybody ask for that stat, and I'm not totally sure how relevant it would be because I'm I, I made a commit today that was like I don't know probably 500 lines of code, but most of it was like a refactor, you know. So like, it's not you know since I was mostly taking code somebody else had written and just moving it around. I don't know. Um, that would be. Right, and I think you, you will encounter that, uh, and the only time I've encountered in my career before was when working with uh, outsourcing, and that is what in some places like India, they will get paid for a line of code, oh. which you will get some horrible code because they are just expanding their stuff into as many lines as they can. So that's not, if you're seeing that, that is usually not a good sign of a company or, or environment that you want to be at so most most places that i've seen that was the only time i encountered kind of something like that and that's where it came from and because you saw some code that just had it was taking them 50 lines to do something that could be done in five or ten and so it's just very inefficient code so i don't think that's something you have to worry about it's mostly about just getting your task done right uh, elizabeth yeah yeah i mean they want to they want to see us get it done Maybe the only thing it would like add to those lines of code are that like, you know, they they want like code coverage, you know, in testing. So, um, if you work on a card, there is some. I mean, it's not super strict, but there is some expectation that you would write either a Cypress or a Jest test or both um, for it. So yeah. that would add, but not yeah that much. Um. The other one question is just, um, how long of a job search was it after coming out of the boot camp? Yeah, uh, it's not totally like a cut and dry answer. Um, uh, like, you know, like I took, it was either six months or eight weeks that we were allowed to like not declare our job search date with Flatiron. I took that entire time doing um, personal products and other courses so that I would feel I was like, if I have the runway, I'm going to do this because I, I, I want to feel really comfortable going into a job. I want to put my best foot forward. So take it with a grain of salt. Um, and then another huge grain of salt that I found my current job very, very quickly after that. So I think it was like two or three weeks um, once I started actively looking for a job um, to getting this offer. Um, but that, you know, like I, I hate seeing anything is, is luck because obviously like you know like I worked I worked my butt off during the boot camp and and after the boot camp and while I was in interviews to get a job but um, but it really was like right place right time like the right person posted in either tech four or four or women who code or maybe she posted in both and I and I applied and I reached out at the right time when they were looking for, they happened to be looking for a junior developer. And I happened to talk to her and we happened to get along. And then she gave my name. And then, uh, you know, I, I pestered their CTO a little bit cause she had told me um, the girl who posted the, the ad 
in the Slack channel had told me, she was like, um, you know, our CTO, like he's super nice and he's, he's great, but like, sometimes you have to poke him because he'll get so busy. He'll kind of like forget that someone applied for something or that somebody's like asked him a question. And so like, um, for the panel interview, he was like, oh, we'll get back to you on this day if we want to move forward. And he hadn't gotten back to me. And I was like, they either don't want to move forward or I should reach out. And, uh, and I was like, you know, worst case scenario, they tell me that they don't want to move forward. So I should at least reach out and like find out. So I, I reached out to him and I was like, hey, when would you guys like to schedule the next round of interviews for? And I just kind of treated it like a, like, which isn't super normal for me, kind of, you know, it took a lot out of me to like act that confident, but I was like, I'm just gonna act as if we're moving forward. I'm not really gonna seem like I'm giving you a choice. But I was just like, yeah, when do you wanna do this? And he was like, oh, do you wanna do it tomorrow? And I was like, yeah, sure, sounds great. So um, I got it pretty quickly, but a lot of it was luck, I think, you know. And yeah, like you said, same thing for personal experience, right time, right, right connection, or even hearing from the same thing from a different person that they, you know, they happen to talk you in, that is a lot of it. And you, you make those opportunities by just keeping an eye out and applying for whatever feels in there. It's sure. one of those that is luck, but you can kind of make your own luck by, by working hard toward it. So not to take, you know, not to feel to take away from anything you've done or anything anybody's done, but a lot of times it's just the right time and the luck that kind of happens. But you make that luck by knowing when to take advantage of those opportunities. Uh, we had one more question for is um, uh, how much knowledge did you have about tech or your tech stack prior to and starting in the boot camp? Um. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that I had written for some tech companies that did some like copywriting um, for a few years, uh, which was sort of like a side gig. Um, so I would say like I worked in retail and service just to be like, you know, more black and white about it. But while I was doing that for a few years, I did some copywriting. So I was like generally aware of the tech industry and also in it sort of but like more in a marketing capacity than like you know never really never really touching or looking at the code um and then so so i decided towards the end of 2019 to pursue this um and kind of like right when i did that i jumped into trying to learn about it um so I would do that differently this time. Like I, I bought some books and I started like trying to follow like along with these books um, to learn coding, which like now I think I'd, I'd watch like a Udemy course or like, you know, a YouTube course or something. Instead, if I were to start over again, I probably wouldn't use books to do it. <laughs> but that was my um, awareness was just like trying to do some stuff on my own. Um, reading about it and, and trying to figure it out so that's not a ton of experience but general awareness and and some some experience writing writing code okay yeah thank you um any other questions Uh, okay, well, Elizabeth, thank you so much for for presenting tonight, for sharing your experience with us. Um, let me go ahead and stop the recording.